On September 21, 1956, test pilot Thomas Uttrich took off in the newest supersonic fighter F-11 Tiger. The aircraft was in the final stages of trials, and the pilot's task that day was to test the fighter's guns in the air. The pilot made two short bursts from the aircraft 20mm cannons, but suddenly his windshield cracked, the plane began to rattle and a few moments later the engine lost its thrust. The pilot eventually had to make an emergency landing, during which the fighter plane was severely damaged and caught fire. The loss of aircraft during test flights, though unpleasant, is nevertheless a common occurrence, but this particular case holds a very special place in history of aviation. The post-incident investigation revealed that the fighter was shot down with its own bullets. As ridiculous as it may sound, the first cases of fighter planes that shot themselves down were very well known from pretty much the very early days of military aviation. Since the first fighter planes were propeller-driven, aircraft engineers had to either use a pusher configuration or place the machine gun up high on the wing to prevent the propeller from being hit by its own machine gun bullets. One of the most important events in the history of military aviation was the appearance of the Fokker Eindecker in 1915. The Eindecker was the first service fighter aircraft armed with a synchronized machine gun that allowed planes to fire through a spinning propeller without striking the blades, which in turn made it much easier for the pilot to aim during the fight. The Eindecker fighter provided Germany with such a powerful advantage in the air that the spirit of German total air superiority even received its own name, the Fokker Scourge. But despite all the advantages, the gun synchronizer also had one significant drawback. An improperly configured synchronizer or its technical malfunction led the pilots to literally shooting off their own plane propellers, which at the best times ended with an emergency landing. In one way or another, this problem remained consistent throughout the whole period of using propeller-driven fighters, whether it was during World War I or World War II. But at least the shot of propeller blades had a clear and easy-to-understand explanation. However, in the case of Otrich, it was a jet plane that had neither propeller nor synchronizer, and the fact that his plane was hit by its own projectiles seemed to defy common sense and loss of physics. But in fact, it was the very loss of physics that were the cause of the incident. To some extent, the excuse was that the early 50s was a period when aviation was making its very first steps into the new, yet poorly explored, range of supersonic speeds. But the lack of studies and knowledge didn't stop famous aircraft companies like North American or Douglas from beginning to develop first fighters that would be able to break the sound barrier. The Grumman company that the previously mentioned F-11 Tiger belonged to was no exception either. Founded in 1929, the Grumman Corporation has produced sport boats, canoes, fire trucks, lunar modules, vans for the US and Canadian postal services, and much more during its long history. But the company has received its main recognition for its airplanes, becoming one of the main aircraft suppliers for the US Navy. I'm a very lucky fella. I've flown a lot of Grumman airplanes. <laughs> The long list of Grumman aircraft includes the formidably looking World War II torpedo bomber Avenger and the Grumman Goose, though not as formidable but best suited if you urgently need to save your daughter and annihilate a private army of a failed dictator. Every time. But the jewel in the crown was Grumman Navy fighters, sometimes referred to as Grumman Cats because of their names. The Wildcats, which were among the first to confront the famous Zeros, the Hellcats, which eventually knocked out the Japanese from the sky, as well as the Tiger Cats, Bear Cats, and all other cats. But unlike most of the Grumman cats who earned their place in the Hall of Fame thanks to air victories over their enemies, one member of this felony family actually became famous for shooting itself down. Of course, when aircraft engineers started the development of the first Grumman supersonic fighter, none of them wanted or expected such fame for their plane. In the early 50s, despite being busy with a big contract for the mass production of F-9F Cougars for the US Navy, the Grumman decided to design a new aircraft which was going to be based on the existing Cougar, but this time supersonic. The draft project, which was privately funded by Grumman, was completed in a relatively short time and stirred the interest of the US Navy. Being impressed with the new Grumman's fighter's potential for supersonic performance, the Navy quickly ordered the construction of the first two prototypes of the plane. Although the project began as a profound modernization of the Cougar, little was left of the F-9 in the end, so the plane received its own designation F-11 and the Grumman's family name – Tiger. The F-11 was one of the first fighters to be designed by implementing the recently discovered area rule, which significantly reduced the aircraft's drag at supersonic speeds. 
It was this rule that the plane owed its wasp-wasted shape of the fuselage, or flying coke bottle as it was sometimes called. The new plane made its first flight on July 30, 1954, and a little later, after the prototype was equipped with engine afterburner, the fighter broke the sound barrier. Tiger became the second US Navy supersonic aircraft after the Douglas F-4D Sky Ray. F-11 flight tests continued until 1956, after which the aircraft was accepted on duty. Its military career was quite short and unremarkable, though, and it was the process of trials, or rather one incident that happened to the Tiger in 1956, that forever wrote this aircraft's name down in the history of military aviation. On September 21, 1956, the new supersonic F-11 fighter, tail number 138620, took off from the Grumman Air Base near Calverton, New York. The aircraft was piloted by Thomas Attridge, a Grumman test pilot. On that day, as a part of the aircraft's test program, Thomas had to conduct test firing of the aircraft's 20mm cannons. The task did not seem complex and nobody expected any serious difficulties. Since it was Friday, Thomas and everyone else at the airbase were already looking forward to the weekend after a long, exhausting work week. It was yet the second time Edrich had to fly the F-11 to test the guns that day. Interestingly, as Thomas later recalled, while he was refueling and reloading the plane after the first flight, they found small scratches on both sides of the plane's tail, which they couldn't explain. At the time, they didn't think they were critical, so Attridge took off for the second firing test. But small scratches proved to be very critical. During the second flight, Thomas Attridge, following the flight plan, entered the gunnery range over the Atlantic Ocean at an altitude of about 6 kilometers, after which he put his plane in a shallow dive and fired the first four second cannon burst. Then Thomas pushed the throttle to afterburner, steepened his descent and, after reaching supersonic speed, fired the second burst. But suddenly his windshield cracked. Thomas felt a thud on the aeroplane as if he had run into something and the engine immediately became rough. Tom throttled back right away to reduce the speed, which helped to smooth the engine vibration. The pilot called the airbase and reported that he had hit something in the air. At that point, he believed that he most likely had a bird strike. In addition to the damage of the windshield glass, Attridge also reported that he observed a gash in the right engine's intake lip and that the engine had lost about 30% of its power. After assessing the situation, Thomas decided to return to base and try to land the wounded plane. Attridge recalled later that the next 10 minutes of the flight were relatively uneventful, but quite nerve-wracking for him since he still could not understand what caused the rough vibration of the engine. Anyways, when the plane finally reached the coast, the engine was still running well, so Thomas started the final approach with the landing gear and flaps down. But as Attridge himself later recalled, when the airfield was just about 3 kilometers away, at a meter 300 meters higher, the engine all of a sudden made a sound like a Hoover vacuum cleaner picking up gravel from a rug and lost its thrust completely. Thomas had to make an emergency landing, cutting through a clearing more than 100 meters long in the small forest just about half a mile from the end of the runway. On impact with the ground and trees, the fighter lost its right wing and stabilizer, after which it caught in fire. Despite a broken back, Attridge managed to get out of the plane and crawl away to safety, as the residual cannon shells began to explode in the flames. Soon the pilot was picked up by a rescue helicopter and transferred to the hospital. Initially, it was believed that the cause of the crash was a collision of the aircraft with birds, but the results of the investigation had surprised everyone, to put it mildly. It turned out that Attridge shot himself down with his own projectiles. Although the cause of the EF-11's crash was determined fairly quickly, it was simply impossible to believe what had really happened. The results of the investigation clearly indicated that the fighter had been hit by four 20mm shells fired from its own cannons, which seemed to make no sense at all. But as it appeared, the crash had a quite a simple explanation. It is still worth saying, however, that even after establishing the cause of the incident, the probability of what happened was simply staggering. The thing is that the bullet being fired from a gun does not move along in a straight line. When flying in the air, the projectile is exposed to two main forces, the force of gravity and the drag force. The force of gravity makes the projectile go down, while the drag force slows it down. Therefore, the trajectory of the projectile is not a straight line, but rather a line that is very close to parabola. If Thomas Adrich, after firing the first burst, would have continued to fly at the same angle, he would have simply flown over his projectiles. But after firing the first burst, Attridge deepened the dive as well as increased the speed of his aircraft, while the velocity of his bullets was conversely rapidly decreasing. 
As a result, since the fighter was moving at supersonic speed, his shells caught up with him and their motion trajectory is crossed. One of the projectiles damaged the bulletproof glass, the second one hit the nose cone, and the third one went directly into the engine duct, damaging the first stage of the compressor and causing strong engine vibration. Meanwhile, the force bullet at first hit the leading edge of the engine air duct and temporarily embedded itself. But on the final approach, when the pilot extended the flaps for landing, the plane bubbled and that was enough to dislodge the bullet, which then also went straight into the whirling engine rotor, breaking the rotor blades and shutting the engine down completely. It was this projectile that was then found in the engine during the investigation. Fortunately for Utrich, since it was a test flight, he was firing inert projectiles that day. If he had the usual explosive projectiles loaded, the plane most likely would have been destroyed in mid-air and the pilot's chances of survival would have been extremely small. What was also interesting is that during the investigation, the scratches on the tail of the plane were inspected microscopically and it was determined that they were from the rifling on the bullets themselves. That means that on the first flight, Atrich was very close to shooting himself down, but apparently his cannon burst went just above the cockpit of his plane that time. Thomas Atrich was able to recover from his injuries and returned to flying six months later. He had a long and successful career in the aerospace industry still ahead of him. As for the plane itself, despite the loss of one of the prototypes, the Grumman managed to successfully use the crash of the F-11 that caught up with its shells, in this way creating the image of the Tiger as an incredibly fast fighter plane. F-11 was eventually accepted and purchased by the US Navy, but its military career was quite short and only 200 aircraft were built. After only four years, the plane was completely superseded by the more advanced F-8 Crusader. For some time, the Tiger was used as a Navy training plane and was also used by the famous US Navy aerobatic team Blue Angels up until the late 60s when it was replaced by the F-4 Phantom. In the history of military aviation, the F-11 Tiger with its short and mediocre career would have most likely simply dissolved among many other unremarkable aircrafts, which today are barely remembered. But thanks to just one bizarre episode, the Tiger will now always hold a special place in aviation history. The episode in which the Tiger has bitten its own tail. And that's the story. If you like aviation and stories like this, watch my video about the amazing story of Douglas Rungway Corrigan, the only pilot to fly across the ocean by mere mistake. That's all for now, thanks for watching and see you in the next video. Goodbye.